Okay. <laughs> All right. My name is uh, Cecilia, and I'm here today to talk about computation as the unifier of disciplines. And I'm going to exemplify this by showing you three recent research topics that I've been involved in. Um, the first one being K2 engineering, the one to your left-hand side, um, which is a, an interactive structural analysis tool um, which is specifically targeted towards form active structures. And um, as the name kind of indicates, it's an extension of Kangaroo 2. Then the one in the middle uh, is Biomorpha, which is an interactive evolutionary algorithm for Grasshopper. And then there's the last topic, which is automated structural documentation with Jupyter. Um, the first two topics, they are very much aimed at the early design stage um, to get give quicker feedback and to be able to explore and navigate a larger design space. Um, whereas the last one is more targeted at the later stages when we as structural engineers need to uh, make our structural documentation. Um, but if we can do this more efficiently, then it can actually feed back into the earlier stages where we can get a better indication of how our structure is working um, and also buy ourselves uh, more time to actually explore more solutions later on. Um, but before I dig more into each of these topics, I'll just give you a brief uh, introduction to my background. Um, so I currently work for Big Engineering. Uh, we started this uh, department back in February, so we are still very new. We are currently eight people. Um, and then I also have my own uh, company, Cecilia Brandt uh, Consulting, where I just uh, do various kind of uh, freelance work. Um, Education-wise, I have a master's degree uh, in architectural engineering from the Technical University of Denmark, and then also have an MPhil in digital architectonics uh, from Bath University. Um, the research topics I'm going to talk about today are actually not uh, really from BIG, but they are uh, a collaboration with format engineers who I worked for before I joined BIG, uh, and also the University of the West of England. However, I have had a chance to apply some of this research at BIG, and I will show an example of that today as well. So the first topic I'm going to talk about is K2 engineering. So when I worked at Format, we started to get more and more projects like these I've shown here, and they are all characterized as form active structures, meaning that the form is directly related to the internal forces in the structure. And they're particularly hard to analyze because they are pre-stressed in their initial state and they move a lot when they are uh, exposed to external loads. And that me means that that breaks the assumption of a linear relationship between forces and displacement, um, which is the usual assumption for our find element software. And because our philosophy in format really is to be these uh, engineers that are very engaged in the design process, then we want to be able to give quick feedback. But the tools we had available to us to, to analyze these kind of structures were very slow and uh, yeah, took a lot of time. So then we started to look into, well, is there something we can do? Can we develop our own software to try to solve some of these issues? And that's how K2 Engineering was born, and it was just really good timing with Daniel Piker, who just released Kangaroo 2 at that time. Um, so this was actually only made possible uh, because of that, because it was so much more stable, the solver, um, and much faster. You might recall that Kangaroo 1, a lot of your geometry just exploded. Um, so um, because dynamic relaxation is really the engine behind the solver, it automatically or inherently deals with these um, geometric nonlinearities that these structures um, behave like. Um, so it was a really good um, platform for us to use. Um, and it allows us, so this plugin compared to Kangaroo, it allows us to actually get meaningful structural output out. So it's not only a form finding tool, we can actually read off reactions, uh, forces inside uh, the members. Um, so it's yeah, been a really uh, good interactive tool for that. And actually the element goals themselves are fairly simple. So here I'm just showing uh, the actual goal uh, in this plugin. It's just based on Hooke's law uh, to describe tension and compression. Um, and uh, 
just by having this goal, you can actually analyze something like this trust structure I'm showing uh, to the right-hand side. And then there's a bending goal, uh, and that's uh, a simple uh, spline beam model, uh, um, and that's developed by Adriansons and Barnes. Um, and that uh, makes it possible to describe the bending moment over the vertex of two consecutive line segments in a three degree of freedom system. Um, so again, it's a relatively simple model, but just by having these two uh, goals, we can actually analyze something like a frame, like I've shown here. Um, I've spent quite a lot of effort to benchmark this uh, plugin with other fine element software to really gain confidence that we can use it uh, for more complex structures. And here you can see a comparison with Caramba and it's giving very similar results. One of the great uh, advantages of K2 engineering is its ability to um, simulate bending active structures, which is, for example, if we have a bending active grid shell, that's usually something that's quite complex to analyze. Because in a normal find element program, you would actually have to uh, model the path of deformation to get the pre-stress into your model. But with K2 engineering, you can actually just start with your 3D geometry, and then you can tell the element that it was initially straight, and then it will start to behave accordingly. So that's a really strong feature about this uh, uh, plugin. And as you can see here, I've been so lucky to work on quite a few projects already where I've used this tool, and it's been really a, a, um, a good experience so far because of, uh, it, it's so interactive. Um, and not only have I used it, I received a mail a couple of months ago uh, from Coda, who designed this quite amazing grid shell for a design festival in Barcelona. Um, and they said they used the, the plugin um, to analyze the structure and wouldn't have been able to do that otherwise in such a short time. So having developed this plugin, this is something that makes me super happy to see that other people are using it as well. So, I'll just talk a little bit more about uh, a project I recently worked on in BIG, um, where I use K2 engineering as the primary analysis tool. You might have seen or heard a little bit about this project already, uh, Mars Science City. Um, it was a collaboration between BIG and Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. Um, and the project um, was about um, yeah, designing this city in Dubai uh, which has to uh, accommodate um, yeah, research facilities and exhibitions and all sorts of space-related stuff. Um, but the design itself should be derived directly from research about structures on Mars. Um, and that was my role in this project, that I was uh, looking into what kind of feasible structures can be built on Mars. So a little bit of an unusual project, uh, <laughs> but it was really good fun. Um, to give a little bit of context before we go uh, to Mars, then uh, we know that here on Earth, um, we are mainly fighting gravity loads. Uh, and we know that if we have a catenary shape, for example, that's a super efficient way to um, carry this gravity load in compression only. Um, and you can see these gravity loads by these black arrows on this image. Um, you can also see I've added some gray and orange arrows. Um, and that's actually the pressure that we are exposed to here on Earth, but we never really think about it because pressure is acting everywhere, so we don't really feel it. But it's actually a massive force. It's 101 kilonewtons per square meter. And uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, something to relate to, then that's approximately 10 times the load you'll have on an office floor, which is quite heavily loaded. So it's not a small uh, load. Um, then if we go to Mars, then um, and we imagine that we want to live in a place where when we go outside, we don't have to wear a spacesuit, uh, then we need to create some pressurized environment. Um, and that means that we, yeah, uh, we need to maintain this pressure we have on Earth. Um, but now, because the pressure on Mars is so much smaller than here on Earth, 0.6 kilonewtons per square meter, now these gray and orange arrows, they'll no longer cancel each other out. Um, and that means we get these kind of inflatable behaviors, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, and also the gravity on Mars is only, well, let's say, a third of what we have here on Earth. So we're fighting some completely different kinds of forces. And that's also why a catenary shape is no longer the efficient shape for us. It's more like these circular shapes um, and tension structures that are very efficient to resist these kind of forces. 
So over a few weeks, I did quite a lot of uh, simulations to figure out, uh, well, step by step, uh, trying to answer different questions. So the first question we, we started with uh, was if we have uh, a kind of a membrane material, say EGFE, because that's what we know here from Earth, and we subject it to this kind of pressure I just described, then it will simply burst. Um, so we need some kind of stronger material, like a cable net made of Kevlar, which can make the span of the membrane much smaller so it doesn't burst. But uh, of course, we're not the first one to really experience these kind of problems. So you can just look at a hot air balloon and see that uh, people have solved this problem before. Um, but it gave us a good indica ind um, indication what kind of spans we could work, work with uh, for the cable net and membrane. And then, because we're not really used to working with pressures as a dominating load, uh, we started to make some simple simulations just to figure out what kind of parameters really influence uh, our design. So, for example, if you have a constant span, then it would be interesting to figure out, well, does it matter if it's a deep or a shallow dome? And but maybe a little bit surprisingly, it, it doesn't matter in terms of the vertical reactions, meaning how much force do you need to actually tie down the structure? It doesn't matter if it's a deep or shallow dome. It's only the horizontal reactions that vary, but we assumed that we could uh, kind of take that in some uh, kind of ring beam. So we're mainly concerned with, concerned with the uplift here. But then, of course, if you increase your span, then you start to increase your uplift forces. Um, so then the next question uh, that would be interesting was really to, to translate these uplift forces into some kind of mass. What volume do we need to mobilize in order for this dome not just to fly away? Um, and it, we, we looked at different options. Um, of course, if we have bedrock at shallow depth, we could just put some ground anchors into it, and that will most likely be fine. But we cannot assume that we have that everywhere. So we looked at um, regolith, the sand which is up there. How much regolith do we need to mobilize um, to hold this dome down? Um, and it turns out that actually pretty big volume, uh, 7.9 meters deep around the perimeter. This is a 30 uh, meter uh, diameter dome uh, to 5.6 meters, depending on the, the plan area of the dome. So the smaller plan area, the uh, smaller depth. Um, now, all of these simulations were totally fine when we only looked at pressure, um, but then we, if, if we have a situation like this where something is about to fly away, then uh, a natural next question will be, well, what can we do to reduce these forces? Um, and then thinking, well, let's add some mass, which is not really what we're used to thinking here on Earth, but that's uh, a different situation up there. Um, but then we start to have pressure interacting with other forces, and then we had to be a little bit more careful about our simulation, uh, because there's this gas law which describes the interaction between yeah, pressure and volume. So if the volume starts to decrease, then the pressure increases. So we had to include that in our simulation. Um, so here I'm just showing the simulation to the left-hand side. You'll see that was the, the initial simulation. The pressure is constant. So the, it will just apply a big mass in the center and will just keep on collapsing through itself because it doesn't know about its volume. But then the modified simulation to the right showed that that it actually finds some kind of equilibrium because as the volume decreases, the pressure starts to increase. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing to be able to simulate that. Um, so you have a load which varies for each iteration. Um, and then we're, I was able to uh, simulate what happens when, when we add mass to the membrane. In this case, we thought it would make sense to make like a double skin uh, membrane and add a certain thickness of water uh, in between because that would help us with radiation as well. Um, so here I'm just showing that we can actually reduce the amount of regolith uh, at the foundation if we add, uh, yeah, say one meter of water, then we can reduce it by two and a half meters, which is quite significant. In general, over a few weeks, I went through quite a lot of simulations and a lot of solutions, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for this tool. Um, and it was a great process with the architects as well, because I had daily conversations. They came by my desk and they're like, show us your simulations. And then they, they were so engaged and wanted to know um, more and more. And it just more questions uh, came out of that. Um, these highlighted ones were, from our engineering point of view, the recommended solutions. Um, and yeah, that was uh, 
more or less it. So just to summarize uh, for K2 engineering, it's just this really interactive uh, engineering tool. And because it's based on dynamic relaxation, it's just um, very intuitive. You can easily see if you made some kind of errors. Um, and um, yeah, it just really gives us a much better opportunity to collaborate between architects and engineers. For the future, uh, we'd like to implement a six degree of freedom um, by actual bending and torsion element. And that's probably something we're going to look at at the hackathon uh, this weekend. If you want to try this plugin, uh, it's available on my GitHub page. You can just download it there. So the next tool I want to talk about is Biomorpher. And just to give a little bit of context before I describe it, um, I guess uh, some years back, uh, optimization was this uh, super hot topic. Everyone wanted to optimize for something. And uh, yeah, I think that's mainly because we got some great tools available to us that allows us to do that. Um, here I'm just talking about Galapagos and Octopus, so you can define some kind of fitness function um, which could uh, minimize a maximum of certain criteria. Um, and I mean, that's, that's really good to make you understand in which direction you need to take your design to uh, improve some kind of parameter, but it's not just not very practical because in reality there's so many constraints you're designing for and we as designers are the best to really capture all of these uh, in, in our uh, head and navigate this. Um, so there are already some great tools, one of them already being talked about today, uh, Design Explorer and also Project Fractal by Autodesk, which are both in some way trying to deal with this problem, trying to let the designer be, uh, have control again, use the computer to create this huge solution space, but then let the designer actually navigate this. Um, and that's uh, also what Biomorph is trying to do in a well, in some ways very similar, but also it also has some differences. And I think I'll, it's probably easiest to just explain how the tool works. So first of all, I have to say that uh, this was an initiative by John Harding from the University of the West of England. So he's really the mastermind behind this. And uh, I've just been so lucky to help with the development of this tool. Um, you can see that it lives inside Grasshopper and it sits right next to Galapagos. Uh, and you can also see that the input to the component is very similar to, to Galapagos. Um, so you input your sliders and then you can double click on the component and then uh, a Windows form application opens. And we've styled this with uh, Maps Metro to really try to make it uh, a really nice and appealing user interface. And you'll also see there's some viewports inside it and that's made possible with Helix Toolkit. Um, so in general, you can see that when you double click this component, uh, you see these um, well, three tabs and there's also an about tab. But uh, the main three tabs is a population, a design and a history tab. Um, and I'll just quickly walk through those. So the population tab is the first one you'll see when you open this uh, component. And initially it would just be empty, but then you can just uh, decide what kind of population size you want and then press go and then you'll see something like this. So what is that? Um, if you say, for example, you have a population of 100 designs, then each dot here is a design. So you have 100 dots. Um, and the idea here is that 100 designs can be very overwhelming for a human to actually, uh, yeah, really compare to each other and select which ones are the one we like. So we're actually trying to reduce the space in some kind of clever way. And we're using a k-means algorithm to try to cluster this into 12 clusters. That's a hard-coded value at the moment, which shouldn't be like having too few or not too many. Um, and then it's make, well, this clustering is from the genes, so normalized genes, so all the sliders you input. Uh, if the sliders are similar, they will end up in the same cluster. Um, and you can see that there is a kind of a, a dot in the center of each cluster. And that's the design which is closest to the centroid of each cluster. So it's the one that best represents its cluster. Um, so if we look at one cluster, this is actually what, what it represents. Uh, so you can see there's a design, and there's one in the center which is the representative one. And the distance from the center shows how far away the design is from the, uh, the one that represents all of them. And you can actually visualize this clustering in 3D if you only have three sliders. Um, so you can see that the designs that are close to each other are actually also in the same cluster. 
Of course, you can have n sliders, so you get an n-dimensional space. So this is just a visualization of, of a three-dimensional space. But it works in n dimensions. And then you can go to your design tab, where you actually see those 12 representative designs. And you can see that at the right-hand corner, there's a checkbox. So you can actually select the designs you like. Um, and you will also notice that if you input some performance parameters that you want to uh, uh, look at during this um, evolution process, then yeah, you can input that to the component and you can look at them to the right-hand side in this window. Uh, so if you double-click on the design, you can see the actual values, but these dots above each design show uh, um, an indication so you can compare these 12 designs to each other. So if, if it's a very vague color, it's a very low value. If it's a strong color, it's a very uh, high value. If it has a circle around it, it's a minimum or a maximum. So in that way, you as a designer decide which one gets selected, uh, and that will be used as parents for the next generation um, when you click Evolve. There is also now, uh, in the latest release, an option uh, next to the performance values to actually minimize or maximize one or more of these parameters. So you can like, manually click the ones you like, but you can also let the computer help you go along a certain path. And here is a, a history, uh, history tab where you actually get an overview of the whole uh, exploration process you've been through. And that's super powerful because it, it, it enables you to see uh, yeah, the path you've been on, but also enables you to go back. So, for example, if you went along the path you're not too happy with, you can actually just go into the history tab, set, uh, click on the reinstate and come back to a previous state. And then you can branch off from there and try some new things. At the moment, in format engineers, we have this kind of funky art installation where we're trying to use this tool um, to um, really give the artist an opportunity to be part of this um, exploration, but also have some kind of feedback that makes sense for us as structural engineers. But it's very early, so I'm just showing you that, that, that a use case. Um, yeah, so just a quick summary. It, it allows humans to interact in these, uh, this evolutionary design uh, generation um, and it makes it a lot easier to collaborate so it's not just me as an engineer saying oh the deflection criteria is the best one we optimize for that but actually allows a collaboration uh, it all lives inside grasshopper so um, it's very quick to set up you not don't have to worry about sharing sensitive data and we've really put a lot of effort into making uh, the interface as simple as possible um, for the future, we are looking uh, into improving the performance navigation a little bit um, and also how to store the data so you can come back at any time and uh, find your history. Um, again, you can try this uh, tool if you go to Jen Harding's GitHub page and download the latest release. So the last topic I want to talk about is automated structural documentation with Jupyter. And, um, at least uh, if you're a structural engineer, you would quickly uh, recognize uh, these tools. It's very common uh, that you have Excel sheets lying around in your team, which does different things. You can calculate the amount of reinforcement. It can do various kinds of capacity checks. And it's great for really setting up your custom calculations. Super easy. But I guess everyone has tried to open someone else's Excel sheet and think that that was not such a pleasure. And uh, trying to make changes to it, even worse. Um, and also you only see the results, you don't see in all of the equations, sub-calculations that's happening underneath this, which is really a problem when you want to create your documentation. There are other softwares out there, like TETS, um, which is something that's integrated into Word, so you write your structural report, and you can call various kinds of template that are predefined, but it's uh, very hard to modify these templates, it just gets overwritten next time you, you run it. Um, and it's very hard to automate. Like you can see here, you have to manually put in your design forces. Um, and um, yeah, it's just not uh, really the, the greatest workflow. Um, so what I've tried to do lately is to try to develop this uh, workflow with Jupyter Notebook. And for those of you who haven't heard of this, it's essentially a notebook that lives inside your browser and it's an open source project. Um, and it has text, images, code, visualization, everything in this notebook. 
And that's uh, one of the reasons why it's considered the best uh, reproducible research tool available at the moment. And not only that, you get access to a lot of powerful libraries uh, like Pandas, which is essentially Excel um, for um, Python, and um, yeah, Seaborn for visualizations, Scikit-learn for machine learning, um, lots of great and powerful libraries. So I've tried to sketch uh, kind of a workflow that would uh, work for the structural documentation. Um, and this is very much a, a proof of concept at the moment. So the first thing you need to worry about is creating your data. So um, I'm, I'm starting uh, with an assumption that we just use the tools we are currently using for our find element uh, analysis, which could be Karamba, ETAPS, whatever. Um, you just need to be able to output your design forces, your section properties, and perhaps geometry um, in a similar format. So you can yeah, use it for all these uh, different um, softwares. And then the structural calculation library is really the essential part of this uh, workflow. So to develop a, a, a Python package um, and uh, for, for structural calculations, and I've tried to outline a, a possible way of, of creating a hierarchy uh, of this library. Um, and that way you create um, a package which can be called in any application, so you're not tied to any software. That means you can use it inside Grasshopper, and you can use it inside, for example, Jupyter. Um, and I think this workflow is best demonstrated by a small case study. So last year I worked on this bending active grift shell with uh, format engineers and the University of the West of England, um, and we analyzed the structure in Karamba. Um, so here I've just, this is the data part, so I'm just creating a, a sim like a text file uh, of the geometry, um, which is very similar to an OBJ file. But you can see that there are like some IDs which I can use for more clever uh, purpose a little bit later. And then I'm also uh, exporting my section properties and design forces to CSV files. The reason why I have two separate files at the moment is because you can have lots and lots of load cases, but you don't want to duplicate all your section properties for each load case. So just as long as you have an ID, you can refer forth and back. And then I've uh, started to build this mesh geometry uh, module, so you can actually uh, like you can um, visualize your 3D geometry inside the notebook, um, and and really uh, that that's using um, Py3JS, which is a wrapper for 3JS. Um, so it's really powerful that you can bring your 3D model into your documentation as well. And then uh, yeah, I've started this timber beam uh, module. Um, and uh, you can see here that this is just a, a quick overview of the, the general uh, structure of the methods. Um, and then um, you have all the section properties as class properties. Uh, and then I've written a number of methods which all has this structure you can see on the right hand side. So the principle here is that you have a number of parallel lists which uh, holds your like, uh, description of your equations, the equations themselves, the results. But then you can, when you call this method, you can specify if you only want the result or if you actually want the documentation that's happening behind getting this result. And that means, for example, inside Grasshopper, you can call your library um, and then you can create this utilization plot. Um, and that's using um, the new CPython uh, component because I'm using uh, SymPy uh, and that's not really a part of the Iron Python implementation. Um, but so your structural documentation, suddenly you can use it in the early design stages as well, which is really powerful. And at this point, you're not really, you don't really care about the documentation. Um, you just want to know how your structure is working. But then when you get to the later stages, you can go into Jupyter Notebook and you can group and sort your data as you like. Um, you can create your timber beam instances and you can call off methods of those to actually calculate the utilization um, for different load cases. Um, and then you can very quickly visualize this with Seaborn. Uh, so just like one line of code, and you get these super nice plots. Here you can see that I've grouped them according to the load case and the element groups. So you can quite quickly get a, uh, an overview of how the structure is performing. Um, but you can also plot this in 3D. So you can identify where are your critical elements, which is really, really powerful. So your documentation is not just some boring text and you have no idea what you're looking at. You can just extract what IDs you want to display on your 3D geometry. And then it, when you come to uh, the last stage where you want to ask for documentation, you can just sort your data and figure out what kind of elements we want to extract documentation for. 
and then you get something like this inside the, the notebook, which is I mean, great, but I think uh, in practice uh, you want to be able to print the PDF, put it on someone's desk and say, look, uh, can you just check this? So that's just like one last step, which is going from the notebook to a PDF, for example. Um, and you can use NB Convert for that, um, which yeah, converts uh, a notebook to a PDF. I would say that the default export uh, doesn't look great. Um, so I've been writing this custom template uh, for this export for Format Engineers, which is a combination of Ginger and LaTeX. And then you get some really nice looking output like this, uh, which I think is quite uh, fantastic and a lot better than any other things that I've ever tried to use. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is... Uh, Still very early uh, days and mainly a proof of concept, um, but it's just, I find it to be really transparent because I can go and read the code, see what kind of methods are behind these calculations. I can use version control, I'll thank God for that. And uh, it's just, uh, it's, it, it just has all the advantages of programming. Um, and you can have this direct link between 3D uh, model and um, your documentation. Um, and you're not tied to any platform, which is really uh, essential to this. The only downside at the moment is there are no templates. Like, no one's done this before, at least to my knowledge. Um, so you have to start from scratch. And at the moment I haven't really found a good way to handle units, but I'm sure there's some way to solve that. Uh, so for the future I've put in here collaborators, because I hope that there are structural engineers out there sitting and thinking, well, this would be cool. Uh, and I'll be very happy to collaborate on this. I put everything on my GitHub as well, so um, let me know afterwards if you want to push this forward. So just to wrap this up very quickly, I hope that these uh, three topics have uh, shown different ways of trying to improve the collaboration between architects and engineers, uh, which is where my daily work uh, is. And um, as you might have noticed, all of the tools I've shown here today are all open source. And that's because I really strongly believe in a collaboration across companies that the best way forward is to share our knowledge and learn from each other. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs>